are we ready to speak to the cosmos? Seeing a woman doing a SETI research, um, looking for extraterrestrial intelligence in a scientific way blew my mind. So now, here I am at Berkeley SETI. Would this extraterrestrial intelligence be able to, let's say, decipher the map of our continents by, for example, putting together all these uh, radio emissions and realizing that in some areas there are more active? But I think it is really a worthwhile experiment to try and uh, design a message. Quite controversial and has some ethical implications of It's December 2019, and this is episode 42 of The Wow Signal. For more information, please visit wowsignalpodcast.com. Hi, I'm your host, Paul Carr, and joining me as co-host soon will be Daniela DePaulis. Our special guest on this episode is Julia De Marinez, young science communicator and scientist working presently with the Berkeley SETI Institute. And the topic for this episode is Moon Bounce. Now, Moon Bounce is basically just bouncing radio waves off the moon in any a number of different ways. And as you will hear soon, both Julia de Marinas and Daniela de Paulus have some experience with that. And so we'll get into that in more depth later. There will also be lots of links in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com where you can learn more about Moon Bounce and about Julia's research. And we do hope to do a follow-up with her when the research is ready to publish. Just to sum it up, though, Moon Bounce has quite a varied history going back to an early way of doing signal intelligence and it's gone through a lot of ham radio projects, and Danielle has done used mount, moon bounce for her art projects, and there's also been uh, now an interest in using it as a way of supporting SETI research. And so what Julie is primarily involved in is a research project to find out what radio waves look like from a technological civilization by looking at What's coming off the moon? It's essentially using the moon as a kind of integrating sphere, and it's it's an interesting and clever approach. And I, I'm, I, I really, until quite recently, I didn't really understand what was being done here and and why. But uh, she'll explain in more depth later. <laughs> Julia de Marinas is an astrobiologist and science communicator working at the UC Berkeley SETI Research Center and with Blue Marble Space. She is a 2019 National Geographic Explorer and 2018 Grosvenor Teacher Fellow and a 2019 AGU Voices for Science Advocate. Her research involves detecting life in the universe through biosignatures and technosignatures, 
and the ethics of sending powerful, intentional messages into space. She is passionate about inspiring the next generation of scientists and teaches to underserved students around the world through the Ad Astra Academy. Julia also runs her own outreach events called Space in Your Face, a space variety show involving comedy, local artists, and cover songs. Wow Signal podcast with uh, Julia De Marines and uh, Paul Carr, and I'm Daniela De Paulis, and host of this program. I invited uh, Julia De Marines um, after watching her talk at the SETI Congress at the International Astronautical Congress in uh, Washington. And uh, she made a very interesting presentation about uh, her project with uh, SETI and Moonbounce. And for some of you who know my work, uh, you might be familiar with uh, also my artistic uh, research on Moonbounce. So I felt immediately very um, impressed and interested in what uh, Julia is doing also because I'm uh, um, a huge um, fan of SETI, so to speak. So, Julia, maybe uh, welcome to our program, and maybe you would like to say a few words about uh, your um, uh, scientific research and yourself. Sure. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. And um, somebody had posted a link to your work, Daniela, about your Moon Bounce artwork. And so I knew about you probably before you knew about me. So I'm equally a fan and just excited to hear kind of more about what what you're doing with your welcome to our but we can talk more about that later um so my background with SETI I'm going to call it a tale study there and back again um when I was very impressionable around 13 I saw um a movie called Contact which I'm sure you all know and probably have talked about oh yes before. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I'm a big fan. Have listened to, <laughs> yeah, listen to this podcast. I'm sure you know what the movie or the book Contact is about. And seeing a woman doing uh, a steady research, um, looking for, for extraterrestrial intelligence in a scientific way blew my mind at the age of 13. And kind of since then, um, I've been on a path to pursuing the field of astrobiology. Um, and it's not been a straightforward path. Um, I did my undergrad in astronomy at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And then I kind of, I was working in some exoplanet uh, biosignature research with a project called the New Worlds Observer, which is now the HabX mission. It's kind of changed and morphed over the years. Um, and then took a kind of a break from academia, wasn't sure what was next and, and, uh, started a master's degree in space studies at the International Space University in Strasbourg, France, where I got to further that biosignature research at NASA Ames with um, an internship and my thesis was based on that. So I know way too much about methane isotopes, if anyone cares to talk about that, it's riveting. No, actually it is riveting, but... Yeah, it is actually an interesting topic. Yeah, but yeah. Well, not for today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then from there was hired by Dr. David Grinspoon at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I know he's been a guest on your podcast before, and I was his research assistant for three years. We did astrobiology on Titan and some education and outreach together, and it was a lot of fun. And from there, I had kind of a twisty, turny next step to my life. Um, I'll just talk about it briefly, if that's all right. Um, I lived on a ship for two months doing education and outreach of the scientific mission, studying the geology of undersea rocks. Um, and while I was on the ship, I saw a PhD opportunity um, in a school called Hampton, Virginia. So I applied to that on a whim. I moved my life there in about a, a month after I got back. And it turned out it was not the right program for me. So I tried out a PhD and did not work out to my favor. So I moved to California, started doing some education and outreach in astronomy, and ran into a former friend, Andrew, Dr. Andrew Simeon. And from there, he I told him, you know, I'm still interested in science, but wasn't quite sure where I fit in in the scientific world. And he invited me to um, volunteer at his lab at Berkeley. And then over the years, 
I was hired on after gaining my feet in a little bit in the in the realms of radio uh, astronomy and astrobiology. So now, here I am at Berkeley SETI, working on a project called the Moon Bounce Project, where we're listening, listening, and I'm doing air quotes if you can't see me, um, for our own radio leakage being reflected off of the moon as a sign of our own techno signature. So it has a lot of um, ties in to SETI. Give it, okay, now we want to talk about the Moon Bounce Project itself. I would just like to say to Julia that uh, her career is really fascinating, that yeah. it's not a straight trajectory, uh, but rather a, re a really panoramic exploration of different sides of science, cultural and, of course, scientific. So that le really, I think, um, it must be very useful for SETI research, right? Where we have to have a, an open mind and a transdisciplinary approach as well. Yeah, that's a good point. I yeah. like to think it's useful. <laughs> I've kind of heard about this project, but I don't know much about it. So kind of, can you kind of explain it at the Scientific American level? The moon is a natural radio reflector. So when we point our radio telescopes at the moon, we're going to get any local signals that are bouncing or headed in that direction <laughs> reflected back. Um, so when we send our I Love Lucy TV shows or FM radios, some of that's going to bounce back to Earth, and hopefully that signal is strong enough that we can receive it. Um, and this this technique has been used for communication over the years. Um, if you're familiar with ham radio, there's folks who, who do this. I don't know how long they've been doing it, but I imagine for quite some time um, where they have these Earth, Moon, Earth um, communications, where they, try, they do these campaigns quite frequently well, they'll, they'll, they'll bounce, try and send their message bouncing off the moon to communicate with somebody on the other side of the world. So we're kind of tapping into that, that technology to get a sense of what our techno signature is. And something really cool about this project is that, that we're not only looking at a glimpse of what we, what we sound like, again, in air quotes today, but it's a follow-up on how our signal, how our radio leakage um, has changed over time. So this original project was done with um, Woody Sullivan um, in, 19, in the 1980s. He proposed this idea in the late 70s saying, you know, we can use the moon as a reflector. And he created a model for, you know, what our techno signatures should sound like. And then did a follow-up study a few years later in the 80s with the Arecibo telescope. So we're piggybacking off of that. And there's also a 2012 study of um, some moon bounce observations. Um, I think with, I forget, and I forget which telescopes, I'll have to uh, refresh my memory, but um, from McKinley et al, who, who did a, the same one. So we're trying to kind of follow up on that because um, there's a quote, and I believe it's by Carl Sagan, but it could be wrong, but somebody was quoted as saying that uh, we might actually become radio quiet over the years. And what we're seeing since 2005 is all of our analog TV has switched to digital. So I don't know if you remember those commercials back in the maybe late 90s, early 2000s, like get your, your digital box today before it's too late, um, when all the TV switched to digital. And that signal is actually a bit weaker than our, our typical analog signals that we did have from TV carriers. Even though there's more nations developing using technology, we might actually be kind of entering more of a plateau of our general radio output as a, civil, as a global civilization. So that's what we're interested in right now. So I'm curious to know, uh, what did you learn so far from this project? Because I know it's a work in progress. It's a research that I understand is still at an early stage. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you asked that because we've we've been taking our data in the last two months and we I think we got our last observation maybe um, two weeks ago. So we're still in the swaths of analyzing it. Um, so I don't have much to say in terms of what, I don't have any sort of punchline right now of this is what we sound like. Um, but right now we're working on modeling from our observations what actual part of the earth we're actually hearing. And this is gonna be important 
when we start to analyze our signals and see these spikes in certain parts of the radio frequency, you need to match those signals to different countries. So it's not an it's a kind of a tricky geometry problem because the moon, you know, is not perfectly at our equator. It's you know plus or minus five degrees, and as the Earth spins underneath the moon, um, our observations we're going to be hearing from different parts of the Earth. Mainly, it's this kind of tangential limb that you'll you'll hear the um, powerful radio signals because our our transmitters tend to transmit horizontally and not down or up. So we're getting things from the limb of the Earth that is pointed at the moon at the time of our observations as the Earth is turning. So there's a bit of a geometry problem right now that we are right. um, trying to do because some of our observations are uh, over a 12-hour period. So, Now, what part of the radio spectrum are you looking at now? Uh, we're listening um, from about... 300 or yeah 300 megahertz to about maybe 1200 megahertz and we're mainly doing it with the green bank telescope uh, are you uh, transmitting with the uh, large uh, the large telescope at the green bank or which telescope are you using for uh, transmitting right so we're not we're not transmitting we're just passively um receiving but we're doing, I see. yeah yeah okay we're doing the um Green Bank Telescope, we've had about 40 hours total of observation time on that one. And we've had about 30 minutes, not a lot, on the Parkes Telescope in Australia. So if I understand correctly, you are uh, simply listening to the radio emission of uh, our planet. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very uh, random, the result you receive, right? So it really yeah. doesn't depend on, on you. Uh, it's not, uh, that part is not uh, planned in any way. So it, whatever you receive uh, at the moment of uh, when you are listening is uh, the signature uh, yeah. of, of, of our planet. Yeah. Now that's a yeah. really big telescope. Is, is the beam width smaller than the moon or larger than the moon? Yeah, um, I think it's, I think it's a little, it's pretty close from what I remember. Um, we were trying to, with the different receivers, it's a little bit different with the right. zoom width. Um, and I think it's, it's pretty close to the size of the moon, maybe a slightly bigger. Um, but we try and center it right in the middle. So we're, we're, we do see a kind of a loudness of, of the moon when we see, when we look at our, what we call the band pass. Um, so we do see the moon is brighter than not the moon because we do right. on and then we do our off signals very similar to how we do our SETI observations. You know, I find this, this really fascinating uh, for several reasons. I, partly because I think it really um, uses the moon bounce technology, the way it was used originally when it was first invented, which was as an espionage tool. So we are spying on ourselves, on our radio emissions. Uh, and um, I think that's really interesting. And also this idea of using the moon as a, you know, just a, by listening to the radio emissions, just as we are looking at the reflection of the, of the sunlight uh, through the moon. So this idea of uh, the moon as a full reflector of, uh, of our uh, surrounding cosmos, in a way, it's uh, really interesting. Yeah. The moon reflects some of the sun's radio waves too, doesn't it? Or is that... That's... Yep. Yeah, so we actually get some thermal interference uh, from, from the moon just being warm from the, from the sun, and you'll get some some of that signal is reflect reflected no pun intended <laughs> in the radio waves so right and and uh, so yeah. is there a difference between a full moon and a and a new moon or do, have you yes. looked at that yet no because um here's why which is a great great question so if we think about geometry when the moon is towards an, a new moon it's very close to the sun right so we we don't always get the exact time of observation that we desire. It's with the Green Bank, it's a lottery system. We put in a proposal and they give us the time based on priority and and we were not a, <laughs> a top priority. We were a little bit lower down the list. So we uh, we requested a full moon for 12 hours because then we would have the most kind of consistent observation time from kind of horizon to horizon. And at night, the local RFI tends to be a little bit lower. 
So we were trying to kind of have the most maybe pristine, if you will, observations during the, the nighttime. So we didn't necessarily request uh, new moon observations, also due to the angle that the telescopes would have to be tilted to get that like low wow. horizon observations. But it is something I do really want to look at because I think that would be... Well, the sun has a lot of radio noise that it puts out, right? So okay. you'd have to deal with yeah. that. Yeah. And I know there are these, we have these things called notch filters that there's ways we can kind of filter out the moon and make sure we're not getting too much of that interference and not heating up the telescope too much too. <laughs> so do you think the time of the day during which you are listening makes a difference in terms of how much um, data, I mean, how much uh, radio emissions you receive? Yeah, I would imagine so. That's something we definitely want to look at um, because it would depend on like who, like what, countries were more active or transmitting at the, at the times of our observations. So again, we don't have, we're not able to specifically say we want this time with this moon angle so we can get, you know, China and Russia at the same time. Um, not that mm. we're doing espionage, we're just like thinking about what the limbs would be if, uh, if we were thinking about kind of a, who are the loud transmitters. Um, but and we can't tailor it to being like we want Europe or Hawaii. We we kind of just have to see what what time the observations are allocated to us and um, where the moon angle is. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question, but um, yeah, it would. Be, yeah. So, and uh, the reason why I, I ask this question actually um, is a bit of a sci science fiction thought I had at the back of my mind. I wonder if uh, the moon was actually an extraterrestrial intelligence listening to us. Would this uh, extraterrestrial intelligence be able to, let's say, decipher the map of our continents by, for example, putting together all these uh, radio emissions and realizing that in some areas there are more active uh, radio transmissions than others. I don't know, what would they make up of the geography of the Earth or our cultural geography of the Earth? <laughs> That's really a cool question. I would say they probably would be able to tell something about the geography of the Earth um, because we would, we we can do this a similar thing when we're starting to have these more powerful visible telescopes, like maybe perhaps the HabEx coming on, hopefully coming online, James Webb coming online, and the future telescopes called Louvoir. Um, I've seen some kind of ideas where they can map the geology based on looking at the the reflected light, the reflectance spectrum coming from the exoplanet. So if you can, I would assume that you can do you can probably create some sort of rough radio map of being like, okay, well, it's louder here and here, and we're seeing this consistent loudness from these areas. So they might really think something's really happening around Arecibo because they do a lot of radar pinging of nearby asteroids. Yeah. I mean, it's a party over there. <laughs> <laughs> that would require an incredibly uh, high resolution telescope, but yeah, uh, and that's that's not inconceivable. It's just beyond what we have right now yeah i love to see these old technologies reinvented for uh, contemporary use i think it's uh, really fascinating sometimes we look always for uh, new uh, forms of technology where we can learn a lot uh, from these more classic ones so recently i was um, hosting a performance in which we had the virtual reality um, uh, electroencephalogram, which is all digital technology and uh, combined with radio uh, transmissions. And at some point, all the digital technologies crashed and the only one that uh, remained really constant and worked till the end was the radio technology, which has been, of course, <laughs> tested for <laughs> a century and is extremely stable. Um, so, uh, yes, how do you see this uh, project um, evolving? So I know there are a lot of constraints in terms of getting a location for radio telescopes, etc. 
but uh, is there a possibility, for example, for this project to become global so that, for example, more antennas can listen to uh, radio transmissions at the same time or what could be the follow-up step of your work at the moment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, ideally it would be really cool to, well, first I really want to see what the, what the data says, um, what the data shows. So that's hopefully going to happen before, my goal is the, before the new year, so maybe I should give you all a call <laughs> after that. Um, but yeah, it would be really cool to kind of continue this research uh, and do it from different parts of the globe because we would be getting a glimpse onto regions we just can't see from the telescopes that we have allocated to us. Um, yeah, just to get, get more of a, a global perspective. Um, and as this project evolves, I recently just sent an email out to this company called Hawkeye 360. Um, they have a series of three satellites that they're trying to do a few things that they're trying to kind of measure radio frequency coming from the earth um, from kind of illegal radio operations or like um, illegal pirating ships or ships that shouldn't be in sanctioned areas so they're trying to hone in on these beacons with this triangulation of, of satellites and uh, we're, we've, we've been trying to get in contact with them to see if they could if we could work with them to produce almost a similar kind of heat map because you know when we, we think about bouncing signals off the moon it's going to be a, a lesser signal coming back and we're going to lose weaker signals and um if we're if we don't have the geometry correct we might be missing a lot so we might be missing some of the information coming from the earth because not everything is going to hit the moon so we're really getting this tiny little glimpse where um if we could partner with some of these uh, satellite um, constellations such as the Hawkeye 360, we could kind of get a heat map of of where the the loud transmitters are, and so that that's one of the kind of next steps that I'd really really like to take. Um, and another step, kind of thinking more about the so I mentioned I do a little bit of education or I have been. Um, I think it'd be super cool to get more youth involved in this moon bounce project that these ham radio operators do because i have um I, i'm really fascinated by by steady and receiving a message and i think a, a little bit about medi and i have opinions about that um but it's not the kind of purpose of this but i think it would be pretty cool to start our youth thinking about what what we were as a globe would say to an et and could we could we even translate something coming from a different culture? So I, I really like the idea of maybe making it a, a youth project of designing a message, learning about radio encoding. How do you encode a message into a, a radio signal and practice? Like how would we decode it? And then, so you get a message, how it would, can you get any information out of it, say from someone from a different culture? I remember there, there was um, some kind of exercise at the Breakthrough Listen booth in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, there the, the was uh, already an attempt to make um, a encrypted message that uh, the public uh, could uh, try and uh, understand and decipher. So um, were you involved in uh, making those uh, messages? I was not, but I'm actually wearing the T-shirt. I think the message is on the back. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay, um, that's that great. Week, uh, our, by our wonderful colleague Claire Webb, who designed the whole booth and put out all these cool creative activities in it, um, and she wanted to do a little bit of a decoding scheme, um, which was pretty fun. I think a lot of people got a kick out of that. Oh, Frank Drake did that back in the '60s, right? With a Remember, that's in Daniel Oberhaus's book. He sent out an encoded message to some of the smartest people on the planet. He said, can you decode this? And many of them couldn't. And uh, I think one guy did. Hmm. That's, was it the, uh, part, was it the part of the Arecibo message, or was it? It was, it, it, it uh, yeah, it ensued from that whole process. Uh, Frank Drake was interested in, well, could we even decode our own message? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, because because if we can't, then then we can't really honestly expect another right. species to that knows nothing about us to do that. So, so yeah, it was an interesting uh, experiment that he conducted. It seems to me like 
you can follow on to that with something, but something the students can manage. But uh, you know, and uh, also, I think it's great to idea have them get thinking about a message, just like uh, was done earlier with like the golden record and uh, and the uh, the plaques on Voyager and so forth. A lot of thought was put into how do we communicate, and yeah. I think the value of that was, I mean, the probability those that anybody will ever pick those up in deep space is very, very low, but the, the exercise of going through that thinking w was very valuable for us. Yeah, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a great idea. I, I would love to see that, and I wonder if maybe somebody would be willing to pony up a little cash to support it. Yeah, you know anyone? <laughs> uh, well, I, well, a lot of the cash is spoken for already, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. It's, it's certainly not me, but um, maybe <laughs> but when my kids I, are out of college. But, <laughs> but I know that uh, the Breakthrough Listen also has um, a sort of prize for uh, uh, the, the best message, right? Or, well, I don't know if that's still happening, but... Uh, it's a Breakthrough uh, Messaging program? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was maybe in the original plan, but I'm not sure if it's still uh, happening. Yeah, I don't know yeah, either. We, could, we should find I out. That, I think that initiative is is no longer, but I could be wrong from what I from what I heard. But I think it is really a worthwhile experiment to try and uh, design a message um, in order to understand better what what we might be receiving, because I think it's really important to look at the uh at, at these communication from both aspects so um also uh, e exercising a little better our potential for creating a message um so yeah i think the two efforts should somehow complement each other and not necessarily being active of course but uh, at least as a thought experiment i think it's extremely valuable in my opinion well yeah, yeah. We, we, talk, we talked to, uh last year to this well, it didn't happen, but this one gentleman, John Lomborg, was that it? Who, uh, his plan was to send a message, transmit it to to the New Horizons spacecraft, and have it stored, have them stored in their memory. So it was very similar to the to the Golden Record, but he wanted to raise money to to do that and to get young people involved in in composing the message. So I hope that so that kind of thing I think should be very uncontroversial in terms of the risk level and could. You can definitely use that as an educational opportunity as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it'd be cool to create more awareness of the topic of messaging because it is quite controversial and has some ethical implications of, you know, who speaks for Earth? Should we be transmitting all of these questions? Um, but I think I'm more interested. Well, I'm I'm interested in both, but I really think we need to raise awareness on the topic of message composition and. You know, are we are we ready to speak to the cosmos, and who should do it, and and why, and all these questions? Uh, yeah, so, that's, that's something that Daniel covered in his book quite a bit, and mm -hmm. I think that's the first book that's really comprehensively been intended for a general audience that really addressed all those issues. But oh, cool, what's the yeah. book called? I, I think it's I'm called uh, Extraterrestrial Languages. Is that right? Uh, I I we we just interviewed him uh, back in October. And uh, Daniel Oberhausen was also at the Congress, um, yeah. and he presented at the, one of the SETI sessions, I think, at the SETI and Culture sessions so on the the other uh, the other session, not the one where you presented, mm. Julia. Um, so, but yeah, I agree that uh, you know this is so much becoming. This is really becoming part of our identity as uh, earthlings um, like our capabilities of communicating with the potential extraterrestrial intelligence and how would we do how will we do that what would we communicate uh, you know and um, and also it is in my opinion more of a process rather than a, a one time effort so um, it's yeah. like learning a language. It, it is a process. It's not something that uh, you you do just in one time. You don't communicate with another um, uh, civilization just uh, in, in one go. It, you build this communication through time. So it requires um, mutual 
uh, effort and indeed a, a process of understanding each other's um, uh, capabilities, but also um, philosophies and um, yeah, it's it, I think a very interesting um, um, concept. Yeah, did Julie, do you know about Daniela's transmissions of brain waves into space? I don't actually know about that. Yeah. Uh, well, we moon bounced some brain waves as well. So if you want oh. uh, some extra data, Julia, don't hesitate to ask. But um, <laughs> yeah, this was part of a project that uh, we also covered in one of our podcasts uh, where we send brain waves into space using ama amateur radio equipment, so with a very low uh, power. And uh, we don't target any object, so it is absolutely not uh, intended as a matey effort. But uh, it is a way for um, connecting people, uh, the participants, with um, the, the, the broader cosmos, let's say. And uh, people who participate really have a great experience. They really find it extremely engaging. So, um, But when we were doing the, the work in progress, we wanted to understand how much the signal would be still uh, intact after a long, long journey. So we used Moonbounce to see if this could be retrieved after uh, the data were corrupted, in, uh, partly corrupted. So we Moonbounced my brain waves. Uh, for now, it, to me, it is just a very corrupted sound. But if you think that that might be useful for your experiment, I would be happy to share the data with you if you think that's, that's cool. Why not? <laughs> yeah. a different kind of signal maybe not a television signal not a radio signal <laughs> yeah. a, some biological signal that maybe you would not receive otherwise i don't think doctors uh, transmit into space their uh, medical data so <laughs> maybe this is something different for you yeah, and I actually wanted to ask you a question um, with your own Moon Bounce projects, because I've seen your website with um, some of the images or was it video that you transmitted? And I, I want to ask you um, a little bit about how you got involved in that. And then also when you received the message, um, what did it look like? Well, I worked uh, mostly with images, so um, I find that more interesting because I like to see an image after it returns from the moon. So, um, uh, the um, yeah, the, the, what I like uh, is that uh, the the image becomes more appealing because it is so pixelated. Because you know that there is another layer of value and additional value to that image because it traveled for uh, you know thousands and thousands of kilometers so and people appreciate that too so when uh, i send them these uh, corrupted images um they uh, they they love it because um yeah, I mean, in an age when we are used to perfect uh, videos and uh, photos, uh, it is quite amazing that people can relate so much to this uh, pix pixelation in a way. Um, so I think I forgot your question. I'm sorry. I, I was just uh, thinking about another. Did I answer it or yeah, accidentally? I was, I was curious about what, what the moon, how the moon distorts the image because mm. what we're doing we're not really um, decoding any of our signals. We're just seeing the peaks in a spectrum. So it doesn't quite have the romance of sending an image and, and decoding the image. So I'm, I think it'd be cool to put a visual to what the moon actually does to radio signals. Well, we, we as I said, I collaborate with radio amateurs. So we use uh, different kinds of antennas and there are so many variables that determine the final results. So the power of the transmitting antenna, of course, uh, also the power of the receiving antenna. And so th there are a lot of elements. Uh, also the ability of the radio operator themselves. That's very important. Sometimes uh, different people receive the same image in a very different quality. That also depends on their skills. Yeah, there, there is partly, of course, these technical qualities that uh, I find very interesting because it really brings the human aspect to this um, 
uh, technology and um, and as you know uh, the distortion is also caused by all kinds of uh, other reasons such as the lunar libration the doppler shift the um, yeah the uh, 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 the transmission of you know the the, the actual radioactivity surrounding uh, the space between the earth and the moon during the reception and so on so um it is i think a number of uh, in, information that it's impossible to recover um and yeah unless i guess you do a very methodical research which is not what i i do for my art project I find that this uh, combination of Seti and Moonbounce has a very intriguing aspect to me, and um, maybe we should do a follow-up uh, podcast with Julia uh, when she has more results from her work. I, I and, think that's uh, a good idea. Yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, yeah, and I'd just let it. Just give us an email when you when you think you've got something you want to share with the public. Sure. Yeah. I'd love to stay in touch um, to both of you. It would be cool to try and receive some of your your moon bounce images or brainwaves or whatever it is you're bouncing off the moon these days. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send them to you, Julia. And I'm very interested in your uh, idea as well to create a message. So I will uh, be in touch. Great. Thanks a lot, Julia, for joining the WOW Signal. You can now tell your, your boss, Andrew Simeon, that you've been on the the greatest podcast in the world as well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. And thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. See you Bye. all soon. Bye. Take care. Well, thank you to Julia De Marinas, and also to Daniela De Paulus, who co-hosted that interview and had some interesting things to say about her own work. I hope this stimulated your curiosity about moon bounce and about clever and interesting approaches to study. And there will be lots more information at the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. Click on those links, tell us what you can learn. And by all means, we, your feedback is appreciated. Now, this is the first time we've recorded an episode using Zoom, and uh, it's kind of easy on my end to record using Zoom because I have a tool called Loopback by Rogue Amoeba. Now, that tool allows me to record, but I I can't really do a whole lot about the audio quality of the remote people. So what do you think? Is that better than our usual quality from Skype? Uh, we Google Hangouts are pretty much not an option anymore. Um, so I'd like to hear what you think about that as well as the content of the show. And there are lots of ways to communicate with the podcast team. One of the best ways is just to email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. Another way is to go on to our Discord server, and there's a link to that on our, our blog at wowsignalpodcast.com. You can also comment directly on the show notes if you want so lots of ways to get in touch with us we're at twitter at podcast wow and we have a page on facebook that uh doesn't get a lot of activity but by all means feel free to come over there and comment and uh our page is easy to find you search for wow signal and come right up we also have a subreddit although it's a bit of a ghost town at the moment feel free to come over and make it more active uh we will reply to that. You can also get in touch with Julia on Twitter, on Instagram, and Facebook. We'll have all that information on the show notes as well. Her Twitter is Life in Space. And is in November, Life in Space. If you've enjoyed this program and you would like to see it prosper and continue and get better, you can provide a small amount of support over at patreon.com slash wow signal all support is appreciated and we have a a small but sturdy band of supporters over there and they do keep they do provide enough support to pay the basic production costs of this podcast which are not 
particularly prohibitive, but uh, there's a whole lot more we could do if we had more support. And go over to patreon.com slash wowsignal and see what those objectives are and how you can help make that happen. Once again, all the information you need about this show is at wowsignalpodcast.com and we would love to hear from you. Please follow us on Twitter at Podcast Wow and, and give us a shout out about the show. We'll follow you back. So we'll see you soon again. There will be a episode 43, probably before the end of the year, maybe two episodes or an episode in the burst. A lot of stuff is we're, is cooking right now, including coming up the first Wow Signal pub, which will be similar to the Unseen pub that we had a couple of years ago. That will that's just a it's a live video chat. It'll be on Zoom. Of course, if you don't want to be on video, just turn your camera off or put a piece of tape over your webcam. Uh, but uh, it's just a gab fest. Nothing, no, no real agenda there. And it, but it, it is in preparation for Wow Signal Live. I'm not sure where we're going to have the first Wow Signal Live, but it's not going to be that far off in the future. We did a technical rehearsal recently and it went pretty well. A couple of minor glitches that need to get worked out, but we're, we're pretty close using Zoom and a program called OBS, which gets you streamed over to YouTube. And you can go see the technical rehearsal over there if you have any comments to make on the technical quality, not the content, because the content is garbage. Just the technical quality. Uh, maybe we, there's something we can do to fix it or get it better. So um, by all means, check that out if you're interested. And we will see you soon at episode 43 or perhaps the next first. Music is by DJ Spooky, George Crobb, and Jason Robinson. This has been The Wow Signal, a podcast produced by The Dream of Open Channel. Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information. All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist. The Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License.